so you're all very welcome to this event, which is the land beneath our feet, public land use and deliverable of affordable housing. Um, before we begin, I'd just like to ask you all to take out your phone and have the QR code function ready. There will be some QR codes for you to scan. Not this one, this one doesn't do anything. Uh, but just so you're ready, because I'll be moving quickly through the slides, and it's good if you already have your phone ready to, to scan a code. Perfect. Yes, okay. Okay. Um, so, the first of the three partners presenting today's event is the Housing Agency from Ireland. Uh, founded in 2012, the Housing Agency is a government body of housing specialists. The Housing Agency supports the delivery of high-quality, affordable homes and the development of sustainable communities across Ireland. And indeed, today's event is actually the continuation of a recent initiative from the Housing Agency to look at best practices in terms of land policy. You can see if you go to their website, um, or you scan this QR code, as I told you to have your phone ready, uh, see? Uh, then you can get access to a lot of material they produced recently in their series talking about land. So I highly recommend that you take a look because it gives you more depth of knowledge than what we'll have time for at today's event. The second partner from today is uh, Housing Europe, which is the European Federation of Public Cooperative and Social Housing. Uh, we represent around 46,000 local providers of housing right across Europe, uh, providing around 26 million homes. And one of our main functions as an organization is to promote knowledge sharing and sharing of best practices. Uh, just to mention very, very briefly, so some of you may be familiar with our signature publication, which is the State of Housing in Europe. The new edition for 2023 is coming out very shortly on the 20th of June. You can access it if you go to stateofhousing.eu or indeed scan the QR code uh, and it'll appear there on the 20th of June. In the meantime, in the meantime, we have this short publication called Trends in a Nutshell. You can find physical copies downstairs at our, at our stand or you can go to housingeurope.eu and you can download it. And then the final partner in today's event is Housing 2030 which is an initiative of uh, Housing Europe, but also the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe and UN Habitat. The initiative is to promote best practices and the transfer of knowledge and best practices in housing policy in the UNEC region, which covers North America, Europe, and Central Asia. And the policies are based on four pillars. So good governance, finance, environmental sustainability, and for the purposes of today's event, land. If you go to housing2030.org, you'll have a very broad range of material on there. You'll have reports, you'll have podcasts, you'll have a policy toolkits, um, and a whole wealth of knowledge that you can access. So I really encourage you to check it out if you want to get more insight and more in-depth knowledge of today's uh, discussion. In terms of the agenda, I'll run through it very quickly. So in a few moments, we'll hear from uh, Dr. Julie Lawson from RMIT University. She was the lead author of the Housing 2030 report, and she has an encyclopedic knowledge of good housing policies, including in the area of land. After her, we'll hear from Dervla Lawson, who, as far as I know, is no relation. Um, and she's from the Irish Land Development Agency. Then we'll move, we'll hear from the local context, which is from Ivan Gallardo from Barcelona City Housing Department. Then a last minute replacement, because uh, our original speaker is Julian, he got COVID, because that's still a thing that happens in 2023. Uh, so we're very happy to have uh, Bernd Riestand here with us from the Austrian Federation of Limited Profit Housing Associations, GBV. And then finally, and I apologize in advance for the pronunciation, Moitscha Stritov Bruce. Ah, okay, I got the thumbs up, that's good. From the uh, Housing Fund of the Republic of Slovenia to give us a different kind of flavor of uh, housing policy when it comes to land in a country that's usually called in transition. Okay. Uh, there is an opportunity for Q&A, but rather than losing time by passing a microphone around the room, we're going to use Mentimeter. So if you do have any questions for the speakers, there will be a Q&A at the end. You can go to www.menti.com. You can enter that code, or to save time, you can quickly scan the QR code. When you go in there, you will have the option to ask questions to the speakers, and that will be at the end. So we'll have a Q&A panel of around 15 or 20 minutes at the end, and you'll have the opportunity then to engage with some of the speakers. So. Um, I would ask you just to maybe, if the, speak, if the question's for one individual speaker, maybe just put that in your question, question for Judy, question for Dervla, et cetera, uh, and try to keep the questions as short as possible because we lose a lot of time by reading out very, very long-winded questions. Okay, so 
Uh, our first speaker is uh, Julia Dawson, and uh, Julie's here. Yes, I welcome her to the stage. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thanks Dara. It's, uh, it's fantastic to be here and to see all of you involved uh, and engaged in this wonderful event uh, of coming together. And um, I have a copy of Housing 2030 in my hand. It exists. It is a really wonderful report, and I say so myself, because it involved so many people. Um, and I'm going to move through some slides which uh, will demonstrate the enormous collaborative effort that was involved in putting that together. So this is about the land beneath our feet, which gives a real sense of the material importance. Uh, of course, we need something underneath our feet, and effective land policies also make that more secure, more purposeful, and more productive. So we've gone to hear for some really great uh, uh, illustrated speakers today from Vienna, from Slovenia, from Barcelona, who are going to talk about the kind of tools that uh, they use in practice. Because Housing 2030 is, if you like, a toolbox. It's not a way to do or a, a blueprint. It's all about the adaptation of ideas to concrete situations in which your city finds itself. It's not saying this is a one-size-fits-all. It's a tool in which can inspire you to adapt to the local conditions and the political preferences and cultural needs of your communities. Okay, so please see it as a toolbox rather than a blueprint. Okay, but what are the kind of tools that we put forward? There are four main chapters in Housing 2030. I'm going to talk about one of them, but see them, if you like, in a toolbox you can't get far without, say, a hammer and the nails. You know, so you need both, not just walking around with a hammer. So we need all these things to come together. And you'll notice in the symbol of Housing 2030, it's a kind of Rubik's Cube that can be made into different sort of arrangements, and it has people moving that Rubik's Cube around. And those people are the human capacity to change. They are the agents of change. And you can see in that symbol also that they're changing in, if, with the social development goals in the forefront. So that is the actual symbol of Housing 2030, that it's, it's actually human capacities and our agents for change to change the structures of a housing system. So in a housing system we have, of course, Governance is incredibly important. And we uh, go into details into the kind of governance arrangements, but I won't do that here. Uh, there are other resources on the Housing 2030 website um, where uh, podcasts and um, uh, webinars and PowerPoints and resources can be found. Also, finance and investment tools. We look at those and how we can shape financial flows to achieve the best outcomes in terms of affordable, inclusive and climate neutral homes and neighbourhoods. So we have a look at the whole architecture from the grandest, broadest to the micro. Then we look at land policy tools, which I'm going to focus on today. And also importantly, um, given the, the context of our earth, climate neutrality tools um, and what ones are effective. The main messages, if we can begin with those, are that there's a, a, a need to rethink housing policy making that has, if you like, been captured by a rather tunnel vision uh, approach. Um, we should be looking at a system, systematic approach or a system shaping approach, which sees uh, housing as not as a commodity but also as a basic need and that we put the right to adequate housing and realising that, that right and using all the capacities we have in our positions, in government, in organisations, in NGOs, to the best capacities that we can bring to that realisation. And we move away from leaving it up to the market and instead we take a more balanced approach in um, actively, strategically shaping that market to deliver the homes that we need. And that requires, of course, a lot of political will and a vision to uh, deliver that. 
and it also importantly requires a voice for people and their cities in shaping that will. And that will needs to be, of course, well informed, not based on conspiracy theories or misinformation. It needs evidence, purposeful policy and mission focused and expert agencies that are there charged to, to develop that evidence uh, well. And this involves also not working as an island, but working collaboratively, also from the no, no, local government with national government, often through agreements or legislative reforms, but also on the international and the European re regional level, as we heard Sorcha talking about today. So land policy, what kinds of things are illustrated in Housing 2030? I hope that you manage to download this report. It really is, it's not only a very beautiful report, but it's a very informative report. And there are different kinds of tools that are analysed in, in land. Public land banking and purposeful development is one of the first primary tools that we talk about. In each tool, we also look at the advantages of its applications and the disadvantages of its, or the cautionary tales that need to be considered. We also look at public land leasing and conditional use in terms of um, setting conditions for long-term um, use rights and also the setting of payments for the leasing and the indexing of those payments over time that need very, very careful long-term vision. We look at land readjustment. Often we've got fragmented, disused, uh, difficult parcels of land, brownfield, and that requires a public interest player to bring those different land uses together, those different parcels together, and in the best interests of the community, with a strategic vision in mind, it needs to reassemble those land uh, parcels into a more um, orderly and um, uh, effective uh, uh, redevelopment. We see that happening in a range of countries, also in crisis situations, sadly also in Ukraine. So it's important that the public interest uh, is advanced through those land readjustment processes and that they're fair also to those landholders who might be involved. Also, of course, land is all about, also, uh, has a value, a very uh, incredible uh, influence on what we do with it and vice versa. So recapturing and reinvesting that uh, purpose rights is very, uh, very important. And you can see how countries with few resources actually use this mechanism very effectively. Um, I lived for a long time in South Korea and that city, Seoul, essentially used land value recapture to build its entire underground rail network um, and also expand its, its, its cities to be a 22 million uh, population city that was very important in which they kept control of the land value recapture process. And of course, as urban planners, many of you might have an urban planning background like me, um, knowing how to use planning uh, rules and zones and land use rights, uh, permission rights, development agreements, very, very important. And finally, neighbourhood planning agreements, putting all those things together with a community to improve neighbourhood by neighbourhood, um, the, the inclusive uh, uh, qualities of that uh, community. It can be, these are resources which sometimes are actually not expensive. It's just about agreeing and uh, setting a vision and working together. So I mentioned that in each tool, it's defined, it's also illustrated with different types of applications and the arguments for and also sometimes against its use are presented. Here's an example, for example, of the public le land leasing tool in which we use the examples of Helsinki, Stockholm, Munich and community land trusts. If you like, going from the broadest based use of this approach to the micro uh, level uh, approach. We also, of course, do this work mindful of the existence of other uh, countries' experiences beyond Europe. So in public land banking, we look 
also in uh, at well uh, other places. Singapore is mentioned. For example, I mentioned the growth machine of, of China and its municipal land banking there. And uh, but primarily, it's a European focused report. But by Europe. UNICE region, the 56 countries in the UNICE region. So that brings us from Vancouver to Vladivostok, actually, and everything in between. So we're going to hear from uh, Vienna later, so I won't talk too much about Von Font. We've heard also, we hear in the report about historical precedents in the ne Nederland for the, the Dutch municipal land companies, which still exist. They call them Kronbedrijven. We also make uh, allusions to what's happening, and which was effective in um, Australia with the West Australian Land Corporation, which had a long run strategy of working collaboratively to address particular needs in housing. And I mentioned also China. I, I should also mention another report in addition to Housing 2030, which was a pre-runner to the land chapter, which is a report which is m even more extensive on land. That's the report um, by Lawson and Ruanavara, um, which is an international review. But there are resources and web links mentioned later in this presentation on that. I mentioned already public land, land leasing and the importance of the contractual relationships using on the conditional use um, to improve that use and also over long, long periods of time and the importance of setting the, um, the lease costs and also indexing those costs so they keep pace over time. In Helsinki, that delivers almost 450 million uh, to the, rev state, the, the city revenue every year. And in that funding, of course, they're able to take a more active role in other housing programs because they have that, if you like, virtuous circle going into um, the city. So, it's, a, it's quite good to think in terms of virtuous and vicious circles. Try to build the virtuous circle in terms of land policy too. Also, uh, we draw on um, a tool called public land pooling and readjustment. And German, Germany has a national law which backs the binding implementation of local land use plans around this tool. <coughs> I'd also like to draw your attention to the way uh, in which Korea has used land readjustment to finance well-serviced megacities like Seoul in the past. In the references, there are links to um, these, these uh, illustrations. Also in terms of efforts to capture betterment for the broader community and known as land value recapture, there are many different versions of land re recapture. I've mentioned China's already. I've also mentioned um, uh, uh, well, I haven't so far, but the US and Irish planning contributions, they have a community infrastructure levy that co-funds public transport and affordable housing. Also with the US tax and increment financing models, which earmarks property tax revenues for anticipated uh, increases in value and uh, attaches those to making uh, expenditures in local neighbourhoods. So again, it's all about creating that virtuous circle, creating that virtuous circle, making it within a, a public interest strategic uh, contribution to community good. Again, I mentioned regulatory planning. I was in the United States in 1993 re researching this issue in 17 cities all across the country. I'm happy to say now it's now completely mainstream. It's something which almost every city, every um, state does in the United States, I think bar one. Um, and so the concept of inclusionary zoning and also density bonus schemes is very, very widespread there and is part of parcel of the norm. Uh, also though, it can be achieved in one fell swoop uh, if we look at the central estate of, of France in which a national law on urban inclusion has ensured this kind of approach exists across the entire country. And even in cities like Paris, they may even make more ambitious goals to do so. We have more, if you like, what I would call fair weather uh, uses of <coughs> inclusionary zoning in England, where that can be these kind of development contributions towards affordable housing can be negotiated if it's feasible. 
So we can see that there's a, a varying strength in the powers of our virtuous circle. And some of them are weak and crumbly and uh, frag you know, a little bit uh, precarious. And others are right in there and shape the whole system. So think about that and how, you know, within the realms of your situation, what you hope to achieve and how efficiently. Also, in terms of comprehensive neighbourhood planning, um, I'd like to draw your attention to a, an intergovernmental <coughs> agreement on a model. Of course, local governments don't always have the resources and expertise to do everything on their own. They need the backing of a, of a, if you like, a collaborative national partner. And in Finland, they have that institutionalised through agreements between municipalities and the national government on affordable housing, land use and transport. They call MAL agreements in which municipalities contribute uh, dedicated sites and land for affordable housing and the national government tops up the necessary support to enable that to happen because of course they have the broader shoulders of taxation and uh, borrowing powers which are stronger than the local government so they're able to ensure that those resources reach where needed at the local level. So intergovernmental inter agreements touching on the capacity of what a city has, land and land use rights, that's a good collaboration that can also be institutionalised. In that case there are 30 year agreements uh, to provide housing. Helsinki's agreement is online, uh, you can see what it looks like. Now I've got to move along, but the last uh, tool I'd like to mention is one of course around taxation. And land value taxation is a tool which can be more effectively used than is used by many cities at present, in which the value of the land is captured for the good of the community more effectively. We should also be applying that to underutilised land or underutilised housing units like vacancy taxes. And we see in Vancouver where they've been able to um, tax longer term vacant properties, uh, a very small fraction of the value of that dwelling goes towards a, an affordable housing program pot, which in the first year of operation, I believe, accumulated 22 million and it's been growing ever since and being spent hopefully wisely on good housing projects. So it's an unvirtuous circle, but a virtue is being, if you like, drawn from that. Um, also in terms of land rights around regulating short-term letting, well Barcelona possibly could tell us more about its efforts in doing that. Some countries of course have been more effective than others and the report reviews that research and perhaps it's worth having a look if you're keen on that issue. And of course the varying impact of global investors in our community. And we see in which some countries have been able to uh, like keep at the door um, the negative impacts of, um, uh, if you like, vulture investors or um, to ensure that the strength of um, local uh, conditions, uh, tenancy obligations are strong enough to resist global corporate landlords who might have other ideas on those social obligations. So that can work, yes, best again at a national level, but it does affect the playing field at the local level. Um, and I'd encourage a very interesting, very interesting comparison between the way in which Germany and UK deals with, for example, Deutsche Annington and its, uh, uh, its experience in those two countries. Okay, conclusion, establish a purposeful vision. Articulate the desired urban development that is committed to social inclusion and sustainability. So know where you're going and use, a, if you like, align your land policies to those, uh, that vision. Ensure in the instruments you have in your hands, especially city planning that you, and land banking, that you have sufficient affordable housing land sites which are able to feed in and support um, responsible uh, uh, providers of homes. Engage for this purpose directly in the land market itself um, by having a, your own land fund or your land corporation or development corporation 
in which you engage uh, with site acquisition, et cetera, et cetera. And promote innovation and good practices by um, uh, encouraging and shaping the rules of competition around what development is able to take place on the land that you have at your disposal <coughs> and that you control the usage of and that you give development rights for. So encourage a good, contestable uh, improvement environment. And we have some examples of how that works in Vienna as well. All right. As I said, you can't read it now, but know that there are some web links. I hope they're all still working. If not, just contact me. And lastly, thank you to the sponsors of Housing 2030. Without their support, this project wouldn't have happened. And it's not just in money, it's also in political vision and willingness to help. Um, so special thanks to also ARA and uh, Jama Linden's uh, organisation and also the housing agency in particular, Michelle Norris and her leadership um, in stepping out and stepping up. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you indeed to um, Barcelona for your hospitality, and thanks to the housing agency and colleagues here as well. Um, delighted to be here today to, to present to you in relation to um, starting from scratch the new Irish Land Development Agency and the land beneath our feet. Um, so, so look, the Irish context, in common with with a lot of what we're hearing today. You know, there are really big challenges there in terms of achieving affordable and social housing, particularly, um, you know, in the Irish context where we have strong economy and population growth, both natural and in migration. We've reached over 5.15 million, first time in over 171 years that we've seen that level of growth. And there's, while there's no shortage of space, the issue of unmet need is there. It's really striking. You know, there's, there's targets for 33,000, but because of that unmet need, that cumulative impact, that is an issue that is, that is causing issues. And the local authorities, government agencies, everybody's working together. So listening to Julie there about the toolbox, we absolutely, you know, I would certainly recommend that. I think it's an excellent um, approach there, learning from the experience and, and opportunities from the strong experience across Europe. So, um, so look, I think that, you know, from our perspective in the Land Development Agency, we were set up to help address some of the deficiencies in Ireland's uh, land management process. Um, that's particularly around public land, but not just public land, but it's trying to deliver affordable housing in a way that better meets the needs into the future. So we have social and affordable housing. And to date, there's always been a requirement um, for 10% social housing as part of any housing development. They need to integrate it in with the development. However, going forward, government has brought in a new Affordable Housing Act, the Land Development Agency Act, and also increasing the amount of affordable and social housing to 20%. But going further than that, seeking to address uh, the root of the problem, because often the speculation is so much around land acquisition and, and, and a lot of the value goes straight to the landowner other than focus on quality and, and outcomes. So this is something that's, that, that we're seeking to address, really. And lots of debates, listening to the various issues there. So currently, looking at land value capture, there's a, there's a bill going through our, our doyle at the moment. And we're also looking at how all the collectives around land value tax, land value sharing, you know, trying to encourage vacancy and dereliction to be addressed. All of these tools are there together. But I would say as well that actually it's really important to see how the balance of that is achieved to ensure affordability into the future. So our mandate, the Land Development Agency was set up on an interim basis in 2018 and with the legislative footing then in 2021. The key aim is around coordinating land within public control to provide affordable and social hands and build communities across the nation. 
So you can imagine that there's a fair bit of public land in key locations that's well serviced with infrastructure. But a lot of folks, those bodies, whether it's you know the health service or the bus service, none of them are inter you know are, are focused on the land management issue. So what we're trying to do is identify land that could be repurposed for housing, both in the near term. And a lot of that work is working with local authorities who are driving that social and affordable housing as well. But we work with them to plan and activate and bring forward that land assembly, but also trying to address some of those strategic areas of interest, particularly trying to support with achieving low carbon and climate resilient development. There are real challenges in terms of climate change into the future, how we deliver energy. We can't do it in a piecemeal way. We need that join up. And most importantly, we need long-term strategic integrated plans that plan for infrastructure and enabling that phase development over time. So there's, there's lots of opportunities there in terms of the, uh, the land development agency working with the local authorities and our partners in that regard. And we're guided by five key principles in this, in this context. Um, affordable, stable supply, trying to deal through the, those, the, you know, the boom and bust cycles that we've seen in the past, trying to build that pipeline, repurposing state land to deliver more affordable housing. But it's not just state land, it is also working with the market in that regard, because what we want is security of tenure um, for people into the future with quality and affordable housing um, that is best in class. So this is what we're doing, unlocking state lands, opening doors to affordable homes. And we're working right across the country, Dublin and Cork. We are delivering at the moment, working with our partners um, on site there for affordable and social housing. So there are 100% affordable and social housing, and I'll come on to that. So cost rental is a focus for us where some, so, something like 80% of the development that we're delivering is trying to build up this new sector, which is cost rental. So it's for people that don't qualify for social housing, and they are the squeezed middle, essentially. So they're up to an income threshold of about 53,000. But, you know, they, they, they can't afford to buy, or they can't afford the rents that are, that are increasing at the moment. So we see a real need to provide more affordable housing, give that security of tenure. So we have 5,000 um, going through planning and under d development at the moment. We also have a pipeline when we're looking at repurposing state lands, about 15,000 units over the next 10, 20, 30 years. And, and, and look, it's about looking at how we can repurpose. You can see there, that image there at the bottom is, is um, Cork, um, it's St. Kevin's, a former hospital there. What we're trying to do is identify these institutional <coughs> lands, or they might be old industrial lands, and look at how we can repurpose those and deliver affordable and social housing in really key locations where, where you can walk and cycle and access all the services that you need. So it's much more sustainable and low carbon. So that is a primary focus for us. And we do that working with our local authority partners and indeed the state interests. But it's not just public land because all of those things take time to deliver when we're trying to unlock those lands. It's about driving land assembly trying to understand how we remediate, relocate. And I think that's, you know, going back to the point about, you know, public land banking, that is important to build the build the, the public land bank, but also try and acquire some, some private land as well so that we have that mix, because some of it will be about repurposing and relocating. But I wanted to mention this initiative because this will take time to deliver. And, and we've heard this in common with partners across Europe we are also working with the, uh, the private industry as well, so targeting housing sites with planning consent where delivery has not yet commenced or not proceeding quickly enough. There are real viability and affordability challenges across Ireland and particular places are really challenged. So what we're trying to do is work with those developers who are facing some of those higher construction costs, viability challenges, and we have funding, you know, we're capitalized to the tune of 3.5 billion. So this is really important in a time of need that we can turn those from private to cost rental and affordable housing and deliver more choice for people into the future. So we're aiming to deliver about 5,000 in the next couple of, uh, in the next four years. And um, the, the considerable demand is ongoing. 
I mentioned those long-term strategic projects as well, where we're trying to look at how we repurpose land around stations and in key central areas, that land assembly and activation back to that long-term plan that gives you the flexibility to enable the areas to evolve and supports vitality and viability of our towns and city centres. So implementation plans, putting in the infrastructure, servicing it. And one of the key things that we're doing on that regard is understanding the context of public land. So we've developed this register, this database of, of public land, so we can start to see where is the location, where is the opportunity, how do we, you know, optimise that public land in the public interest. And that was one of the requirements under the LDA Act 2021. But importantly as well, that will help to build the pipeline because this relevant public land, there's also a affordability requirement on that. So in places like Dublin, 80% of residential development will have to be for affordable, 20% for social. So there's opportunities there where you'll start to see the pipeline building and that's the importance of effective policy tools. And the other thing is we can acquire that land at existing use value um, for, the, for the LDA and for the public sector in the public interest. So really to, to try and finish off on building the pipeline, public land is one of our most valuable assets and a key lever for the state in addressing its priorities and supporting sustainable growth and prosperity. And we've not just used that register of public land, we're also reporting to government every two years where we've I've identified certain lands that can, could be repurposed. They might be a bus depot today, they might be, you know, beside the station, just brownfield lands. We're saying these are lands that could be repurposed, not just in the next 5, 10, 15, 30 years. So it's starting that journey to build the pipeline so we can have a stable and sustainable supply. So it's first of its kind of analysis. I was going to show you a video, but we'll, we'll put a video up on the housing agency website as well. So a link to that. I mean, these are early days. There are challenges and opportunities too. But I think it's about that balance of interest and understanding about viability, affordability, and how we do this in the public interest and ensure that we're supporting the vi viability and vitality and the evolution of our towns and cities as great places to live, and particularly in terms of climate resilient and low carbon way of living. So I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you. I speak very loud, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> I'll try. Um, should I pass this? Okay, sorry for my photo. I am Ivan Gallardo, uh, architect from Barcelona City Council. Um, uh, I was gonna explain, I had a couple slides here. Uh, I was gonna explain a bit of, about Barcelona, the context, but uh, I will skip them because uh, you, I think you have all seen the uh, plenary, uh, the plenary uh, which uh, all of our mm, petitions and so they have been complaining about uh, our mm, uh, level of public housing here in Barcelona, which is around 1.5%. One, one, 1. Of the housing stock, uh, and there are some figures here. But you also have uh, received this um, this uh, publication here, so uh, it is in all in here. I'll go uh, fast with that. Let me just say, uh, rents in Barcelona have risen three times uh, um, faster than the household incomes in in the last 20 years in Barcelona, and also um, that uh, we have a de deficit of 90,000. Um, um, affordable uh, units to meet uh, the European uh, rest of Barcel of uh, housing stock that is 15%. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm so nervous, but I'm sure you all understand and also uh, forg forgive my Spanglish. So uh, I was uh, I was going to talk a bit about uh, the duration of affordability, which is something it's. Uh, um, it's uh, worrying, is, worrying us in Spain, or also, uh, particularly in Barcelona. Uh, in the last uh, 70 years in Spain, there has been uh, a huge uh, build of uh, houses, of ten, uh, almost 30. 
almost 30 million, uh, half of them were subsidized, but now uh, mo most of them are already in the, uh, uh, they are not protected anymore. So only uh, in the last two years in, Bas in Catalonia, we passed a law that makes the all uh, new protected house houses uh, permanently, permanently affordable. So this is only a first step. We are still uh, waiting for the results of that. But uh, I, we think in, in Barcelona, it's, it's something was really needed because if not, all the efforts go uh, into nothing uh, in the end. Um, here I was going to um, explain a bit about uh, the legal requirements in Spain. They are made uh, by law. Uh, there's a Spanish law uh, recently passed uh, that uh, um, has this requirement of 20% of uh, social housing in brownfields. Uh, this requirement is 30% uh, in Catalonia because of a uh, regional law. And uh, this same regional law allows Barcelona to uh, ask for the 40% of social housing. I'll explain a bit later about this social housing, how we, how we, how we do it. And in fact, in Barcelona, uh, our last development, de development uh, we are asking for around 45. So it's uh, above uh, our legal requirement, but Barcelona is uh, still pushing a bit more. And I was uh, I has this challenge of explaining in two minutes how how do we do it. Uh, so uh, this is a um, uh, an area uh, near from here in Marina del Prat Barmel, sector three. It's a former industrial area linked to the port in in Barcelona, with some uh, old warehouses. Uh, and the owners of this uh, this area are they are all. Uh, um, all uh, private, 100% private. These are the these are the the owners. There's just 12 of them. The, there is a, a public uh, project to transform this area. So uh, they are asked if they want to make this transformation. They are not obliged, but they can do it. They they presented this uh, project with uh, housing. Uh, here you see how uh, the shape of it. Uh, I marked here uh, all the housing where it is. Uh, you can see it in this. This shape is a bit strange. I'm sorry, <laughs> but, <laughs> but this is the shape it has. Uh, and also, uh, as I as I mentioned, we have this requirement for social housing. This is the 45. Uh, the shape it, it takes uh, once you you put it in the in the map. And um, oh, these uh, landowners uh, must also transfer 10% uh, of the value of the buildable uh, area to the city council. Also, the green areas, you don't see them. I, don't, I cannot uh, show you. And the streets and also land for the equipment. Uh, everything this uh, it goes to the um, municipality. So uh, this 10% takes this uh, the, pr uh, the shape of this 20% uh, 25% of uh, pink areas that are the ones that uh, municipality receives. Uh, so what I was gonna explain uh, is uh, I'm gonna explain uh, the mm, the well <laughs> Uh, this, uh, these operators that we are uh, using uh, in order to uh, achieve this affordability, affordability of, the, of uh, our land. So uh, we have uh, the public one. Uh, this, this is the uh, Instituto Municipal de la Habitatge, which is where I, I work. Also, uh, uh, public uh, private uh, metropolitan uh, partnership, which is Habitatge Metropolis Barcelona. And also uh, uh, agreements with non-profit uh, companies, uh, which are uh, which is uh, those uh, you see here. Uh, some some of them are for uh, rental and mostly uh, run by uh, foundations, and others are right of youth cooperatives. Okay. Uh, what uh, the prices of the land? I, I will explain this uh, just a bit uh, because uh, uh, what we do is to we never sell the land. What we do is to lend lend it. If it's our uh, institute, uh, it's uh, of course free. But if there's other uh, operators here, um, 
the prices are uh, we, we call it symbolic or at least very low this is uh, the way we 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 manage to to improve the affordability uh, for the metropolitan uh, ppp uh, yeah, the ground lease fee is for uh, 10 10 how uh, 100 years uh, euros per unit per year so uh, this is uh, what they pay to us and also uh, for the uh, non-profits, uh, the fee is uh, zero for the first 25 years uh, or until they, they pay their loan, the first loan. And then uh, the, the, the next years, the fee is 1.43, 1.4 euros per me uh, square meter. And that's around also 100 per, per, per unit. Okay, I was gonna explain a bit about those instruments, uh, but uh, I'll see, I think I will skip it because I'm running low of time. This is the, our, our uh, IMAP, the public one. Uh, we are uh, exponentially multiplied uh, our capacity to mo to manage uh, this, this, these buildings. Uh, uh, this is the the agreement we signed in uh, 2020 with uh, this social partnership. Uh, it provides uh, the granting of leasehold over uh, land by the city council to uh, those uh, represent uh, organizations which are the more representative of uh, our our city. In this agreement, half of the land, uh, six, 60 uh, percent, is for rental, and 40 percent is for cooperatives. This is where these uh, these uh, projects are taking place. You see a void in the middle. It's, this is important for the the thing we are explaining later. And also, I had some explanation here, but you have it uh, about the uh, PPP uh, metropolitan PPP in here in Barcelona, which uh, the goal is to 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 build uh, uh, 4,500 uh, rental uh, units in ter in eight years. So the uh, other thing, I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm sorry about this uh, bit strange presentation. But the other thing I wanted to to, to address is uh, the problem we have with land in the city center. Uh, the way we receive land is because uh, is by via uh, the urban transformation, and we don't have this in, in the central Barcelona. So we had to uh, to extend the use of inclusionary zoning to consolidated urban land. So we, we passed this, uh, it's not a law, but it's some urban, uh, the, it's, it's something we, we can do. And uh, we, we, we asked these uh, developers to, to, the, um, to make 30% affordable housing requirement in most of major building renovations and new constructions in existing plots. So here you see, uh, uh, in, in red, you see marked the, the places where the transformation is, 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 is taking place in Barcelona. And this is the, the heat map of uh, we, uh, where we foresee this 30% uh, uh, will, will uh, achieve this, this goal. Uh, and this is something that's being controversial because uh, we are... Uh, we are mm, touching the, the the place of the free market, so <laughs> I, can, I can tell this has been controversial in the last years. But we, uh, what we have seen is uh, uh, that uh, in the first years, the the number of building li licenses is similar to that uh, of the previous years, and that we are already um, we are already having an increase in the in the number of uh, protected housing we are receiving. So uh, quite. Uh, got quite happy with that, although uh, it is not sure uh, this is something it's going to be continuing uh, developing because of the um, political change. Uh, it's going to happen here in Barcelona for, uh, as we foresee now. And that's it. I'm, uh, that's uh, my presentation for today. Thank you. Hello from my side, and thank you for the possibility to present something here from the side of Vienna. And it's uh, uh, 
all I heard uh, up to now, it all uh, all is going in the same direction, and I hope that uh, there are some ideas for you from the uh, Viennese uh, from the Viennese example as well. And what we learned last from uh, very positive, uh, for my, in my opinion, and in comparison to Vienna, from the situation uh, in Barcelona that you try to bring a certain diversity in your measures in so that you have a variance of, of ways to go. Um, well, um, just uh, an overlook of uh, Vienna. We are around 2 million inhabitants uh, reaching this year uh, with 15% uh, growing in the last uh, 10, to, uh, 10 to 13 years. Uh, so, just to give an idea of the size of Vienna in population and in, in growth rate. Uh, here, a funny introduction. This is a <coughs> uh, advertising uh, which has a, a good, uh, good message. You don't have to live in these apartments uh, to love Vienna. It, it will do you own them. So, this is... A, Vienna is rather well known, which has good uh, parts for tourism and bad parts for investment uh, in some ways. So there is a real, uh, without land policy, affordable housing priced out of the market and an increase of land. What was uh, the background to set stronger measures in Vienna was that we had in the last 15 years a uh, pr uh, price going up fivefold, which is rather incredible, in a, especially in a city of Vienna where we have a long, long tradition of, uh, uh, of social and affordable housing. Uh, and affordable housing is a funny, uh, a a funny saying. Uh, what is unaffordable housing? This is the other side of the... Uh, so we should keep that in mind. It's vacant houses. Yeah? And this uh, was a picture here. Uh, well, I think there are two main points in, in this way. One thing is... Um, Vienna has historically a big share of land and kept it because there are quite a lot of cities who sold their land, uh, looking through all Germany and, uh, and so on. Uh, so, um, and this owned by the city of Vienna is all priced by, on a cost-based uh, cost rent calculation. Um, uh, just a, a remark at this point, Vienna has more land than its size. Um, well, inside the, uh, the borders, it has not more land, uh, evidently, but uh, Vienna has quite a lot of land outside uh, to secure water supply, to secure agricultural supply for the city. So uh, just an idea and discussing with international investors uh, coming to Vienna and making a rating of the city of Vienna, this is rather important uh, be take, uh, importantly taken into account that there is a big uh, space behind this city. Well, and the one thing is there is a status and don't lose it. And uh, the other thing is how can you further uh, do further land acquisition for public use uh, following... Um, all the ideas in front um, you heard already the, in the last presentations. And there is one is the land banking side, active land acquisition um, uh, by the city of Vienna with budget of the city of Vienna just trying to buy land. Uh, and the other thing is zoning politics. And this is uh, the main purpose uh, we are looking at to look at the structure of the tenure. Uh, what you see more to the red side, this is uh, municipal housing, which is on a cost-based rent. And uh, the other part uh, is limited profit housing associations, which is 
on the national uh, regulation as well on cost-based um, uh, co cost building. And then you have private rent, additional this private rent before 1945. We forgot that the, the, the <coughs> war is so far ago. Uh, we still have a regulation on all this old uh, housing stock from before 1945. And uh, private rent, 11% is, um, is rather small and owner occupation uh, as well. Uh, some, uh, some authors like um, <coughs> Shane Phillips, who was in the auditorium before, in, in his book, if you have read it, a very interesting book, he said we, Vienna is more on the communist side, but uh, uh, this is an interpretation uh, which we excuse for Americans, but in, <laughs> in principle, I think we are on the logic side for, uh, <laughs> and we don't want too much of unaffordable housing in the city <laughs> because we don't know for whom it would serve uh, well here a small comparison what that means as well for for rent uh, municipal housing limited profit housing uh, rent niveau and the for-profit housing uh, and if you have here the for-profit housing you have to know there is the part with the regulation already in it that that means the for-profit housing outside the regulation what i said uh, stock before 1945 is much much higher it's around 13 14 uh, euros per square meter so if you have no initiatives you are up at that rent level but you don't have enough production but no one is not very many people are capable to pay this so um, this is a, a short description of the land banking system. I think uh, uh, for uh, time reasons, this is not so interesting. You have pre uh, presented different things. It's an important instrument, but it's easy to imagine how it works. Uh, what is a new uh, development coming out of the fivefold uh, land prices? This is uh, the interested part I wanted to present. Uh, we made uh, a re revision of the, um, of the regulation for subsidized housing that every new zoning, uh, if it's in former agricultural land or inside the city, uh, that means all the brownfield development, everything. When you have a change in zoning, which is more than 5,000 uh, square meters, so the very small, uh, the, the small and uh, in, in, in small zoning uh, uh, situation, nothing happens. It's um, uh, but 5,000 is not so much. On the other hand. In every situation where the, there is a zoning above 5,000 uh, square meter, the city says you have to give two thirds of the new uh, uh, of the new area which is created by the zoning to subsidized housing. Uh, and this was a big discussion, but uh, to come into the cultural situation between uh, uh, a free market sector, for-profit sector, and uh, cost-based sector. We don't, in, um, in Vienna, we have a long tradition that everybody is speaking to everybody. So even the private side uh, were for a regulation in this direction because of the private investors, uh, uh, it, they are not only landowners on the private side, they are as well as developers on the private side. So uh, everybody knew that is not, uh, you can't go on like that with, uh, uh, with these land prices. So um, it was just a discussion. Uh, the private sector would have preferred 50%. Uh, and the public side finally written down there is uh, uh, two thirds of, uh, of the new created land by zoning has to be offered at a price and uh, which is not so high, which is 188 euros per 
uh, per square meter, um, which is in comparison to, and, and that happens in, in the center of Vienna, where prices are 1,000 or might be 1,200. Uh, they have to use it on this price basis. They can keep it and do their own subsidized housing. Subsidized housing is open to everybody, as well to the private sector. But he is for 40 years under, under a regulation uh, on a cost-based rent. And, um, but uh, preferred is uh, because of the land transformation to get subsidies go by um, in, a, in a public process where the land is offered publicly uh, to all companies, uh, to all developers. So by this measure, quite a lot of, uh, the <coughs> of Brownfield goes not to the city, but to cooperatives who are on a cost-based uh, element. So you bring the land out, this new created land, you bring out of, uh, of the market logic uh, to a cost-based and therefore more social logic. And well, we have no problems with it. There was no political pressure. Um, there were discussions and we speak together and the cooperations or the, we have a special group of, um, uh, of companies um, uh, under a special law who have cost-based uh, social housing. Uh, these, there are always uh, 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 connections to the private sector. I myself, uh, for instance, I was 10 years on the banking side and made development for a bank. And then I made development for the city of Vienna in a public, uh, in public unit. And now then 15 years, I'm in the, uh, in the side of limited profit housing. So, and I just want to say it works. Here is a picture. Uh, just a zoning picture, and which shows that it did work. Uh, here are just the main pillars of the housing um, policy, and uh, half a minute I take. Um, what I want to transport as an important thing, uh, the social sector, it's always a question, who is negotiating on which market? And in Austria in total, and in Vienna, it's a, it's a bit higher, uh, the, the cost-based sector has 40% of the market. And he is a real investor. So in the direction land uh, buying, uh, banking, uh, com uh, construction companies, in all these fields, this sector is a stronger economic partner than the private sector. And he has, as the system is a revolving fund sector, he has equity, he's a very secure sector. We get much better conditions in the bank between um, 50 to 100 base points, if this, uh, this means anything to you, uh, the <laughs> uh, half to full. So uh, life is not something you sit down somewhere and you are good person, you have to be in the position to negotiate. And here is uh, shown where are the differences and with this 40% as a market share, uh, you can start with this. Austria has the positive situation to be in this situation. And I think all these presentations are shown here, are a bit of the criteria, and what this is uh, an interesting, if you look in cost rent, uh, without interest, you have this line. With interest, normal bank interest, you have the red or the blue line, the red and blue differences without subsidies or with uh, subsidies. So in our companies, we are cost-based as well without uh, subsidies. And the green line is what we call market. And you see, if you pay the construction, you pay the interest to the bank, you are here in this field, and the rest is capital gain redistribution up. 
we are with a housing concept we are discussing for affordable housing we don't do uh, redistribution down from the rich to the poor if we don't do it we do distribution from the poor to the rich and you can measure this if you look um, at, uh, at UK for instance UK is a very uh, economic orientated and they have the highest allowances for households 4% of GDP 4% of GDP it's incredible Austria in total has uh, 0.5 um, GDP uh, percent of GDP in the housing sector from public dis, uh, expenditure and so the market driven thing it goes just to investors I think the point to stop thank you it was too long <laughs> ah, this is just the comparison of how much uh, of the GDP you have US and we are in the same range, but the effect is a bit different. <laughs> well, here you are. Sorry. Thank you very much. Um, hello. Um, uh, from my point of view, this was a very interesting day because I heard so much about uh, land policy in different states, and um, uh, having the having the ability to talk about Slovenian uh, model and Slovenian experience, it's um, it's very important for me to to say that uh, in some aspects. Uh, some things that uh, are, are developed now in these states uh, have already happened in the past in Slovenia. Uh, and uh, the point is uh, uh, that uh, we are a state in transition and Slovenia as a young country uh, which uh, uh, arose from in 1991 from uh, let's say the Balkan uh, Yugoslavic state um, it it went through that stage where we had uh, uh, we had let's say a common economic system we had socialism we had parliamentary parliamentary uh, let's say democracy but uh, we replace that with parliamentary democracy in real time. Uh, we market economy and private property, uh, and be before we have a, we had state property, and um, in the times of state property, uh, we had let's say a preemption right. So we had long term leases. Uh, we had uh, rent in perpetuity. Uh, we we had uh, different measures that nowadays uh, different countries have imposed, but we abolished them in 1991. That's a, a bit of a funny thing. Um, so, uh, in 1991, we had a new uh, Housing Act, uh, uh, which was enacted and defined the housing policy in a new era, and that was the point, and the basic principle of the Act was that every individual must see uh, to settle one's housing situation on his own, but uh, the state must arrange a system to help those citizens that are unable to do so by themselves. So um, from, that, uh, from the state point of view, uh, the state went even further on. So uh, it said because the, uh, the housing, um, uh, housing funding that existed in former Yugoslavia was abolished, um, and they, they had no other uh, means of financing because the banks were not developing that kind and Slovenia was in the, was in the transitionary era. Uh, it was decided that uh, the housing fund of Republic of Slovenia will be developed uh, and uh, it was established in October 1991. So that's not so long after the state was uh, the state was uh, uh, at the beginning, and uh, the point was uh, that the financial support uh, was to be given to people through this housing fund. So the fund at first was just a financial fund, and um, because uh, it that proved that um, that policy that uh, people will find a way to solve their problems if the state gives them money, and um, it became a problem because um, people don't have the knowledge. 
they didn't have the support of the system, so they, they didn't have the let's say how to how to get the land, uh, the ability to acquire land, and um, that was not enough. So um, the housing f uh, found got let's say a new task, and the task was uh, to become a real estate fund and to give support to local communities, to local funds, uh, also to uh, to physical natural persons, also to uh, non-profit uh, agencies agencies and associations and to give them loans and to, let's say, create that uh, that ability for the people to solve their housing problem. And uh, uh, later on, uh, it also began like, let's say, the main uh, executive uh, agency found uh, for providing uh, and for having the state housing uh, uh, built in, let's say, in the long term era. And uh, first of all, we have to mention that the Housing Act uh, also, let's say, had this process of privatization. And uh, if we see the numbers here, from uh, 652,000, let's say a little bit more, uh, a lot of, um, of the state-owned and the public-owned dwellings were sold to individuals. And what's the problem now? You see the, uh, you see the numbers that uh, remained from that time, but today we face another problem. We face the problem that uh, those people that bought the apartments at that time didn't have the knowledge how to take care of them. They didn't invest in them like the public agencies, public funds would. So um, from that point of view, this was a mistake. And nowadays we face different problems. So how to help those that didn't invest and how do we have to, let's say, um, uh, have uh, certain measures to, uh, to help them uh, 30 years later. So we could talk about that problem uh, quite a bit of time, but we don't have those. So if you want a bit more information, you can uh, we can talk a bit about it later. But in 2004, Slovenia had another milestone and be, uh, Slovenia became a member of European Union. And due to this, uh, we also, uh, let's say, uh, had some changes in spatial planning system. And wh why that is important? Because uh, Slovenia and the whole Balkans, we had quite a similar spatial planning system that was uh, functioning, let's say, because it, has, uh, it had also uh, a certain, let's say, priorities when public, uh, public uh, agencies and funds wanted to build something. But um, in Slovenia, in New Slovenia, the, uh, we had quite a bit of changes on this area, and from from the point of view, the transition had uh, quite uh, had quite a blow to the spatial planning system. And from that time, we had four laws um, uh, uh, four laws that were dealing with the subject of spatial planning, and the last one was adopted in uh, 2021, and it's in use, let's say, for about a year. And um, and what's the the problem of the, the this legislation? The problem is that uh, we have quite a similar hierarchy of plans. Of course, uh, the spatial spatial development strategy of Slovenia is the highest, but from 2004, the spatial planning strategy of Slovenia wasn't changed. So we had laws in between. We had different ways how to deal with the subject, but we didn't change the spatial planning strategy. So it's under revision from 2004 and going on. So um, that's, of course, that's not OK. And uh, uh, we are not proud of that. But um, that's a fact. And Slovenia is also a unitary country. We just have two levels. Um, someone, some would say we, you just have two million people. How don't you communicate the fact that um, uh, you could work better? With two million people, there must be easier to reach agreement as in 50 million states. Huh? Uh, but it's not so easy uh, if you know Slovenians. And uh, <laughs> uh, just to put that uh, on the side, uh, we have two levels. And the local level uh, has 212 municipalities, from which 12 uh, have urban metropolitan status. And those 12 have really the problems with uh, the lack of uh, dwellings for non-profit and for affordable housing, but also for other types of housing. And um, 
like in most other unitary countries, we also have the problem because, because uh, we are also changing the structure, how, uh, who de deals with uh, some issues. And for, for example, we've also changed the, the ministries under which uh, the special planning uh, is uh, falls under. So the last change was in the uh, beginning of this year. So it, uh, now it falls under the Ministry of Natural Resources and Special Planning. And um, every change has its time. For example, every change has six months or a bit more. And then we have new structures, new expert, and uh, the, we, we as uh, one of, uh, let's say, carrier or agents on the uh, social housing and affordable housing area, um, we have a problem with that because um, there's not a stable organization that we, uh, or ministry that we could talk with and to, to work with. Okay. I'll, I'll just hurry. And, <laughs> and um, the governance of land in Slovenia um, is uh, like that, that we as a housing fund, uh, as a main executor of national housing policy, 250 and 230, we have a problem because we cannot access directly to the land, we cannot change uh, the land use. We cannot. Um, we don't have, let's say, uh, special uh, special rights uh, in changing uh, special pl special planning uh, process. Uh, we also, uh, let's say, uh, development of our projects. You know, we are kind of on our own, um, and we have to take care of the economic side of it uh, on our own. And we must also acquire acquire land uh, on our own ways. That it means we have calls, we go to public auctions, we don't have a permanent st state financing for this purpose. Uh, we uh, we have the preemption right from uh, the from 2021. But the fact is that uh, the preemption right without the f stable financing is quite hard to let's say uh, to uh, to make a use of it and uh, in the the strict sense we are uh, we are hindered in our project uh, project acquirement of lands um, but we strive and we have uh, quite a lot of land because we were cautious in the past and um, <clears throat> uh, that means that we can develop our projects. Um, and also in uh, uh, our housing fund is also torn between private projects, uh, its own projects, and uh, also uh, local projects uh, with, uh, uh, with municipalities. Municipalities, for example, they can uh, give uh, certain distinctions to uh, or certain um, um, uh, certain priorities to their housing, local housing funds. And we as a state housing fund, we don't have that. For example, they can say, uh, you don't have to pay the communal taxes or uh, you, you're exempt of them. <coughs> Sorry. So we don't have that right and we cannot demand from them that. And um, we also don't have the special, uh, special treatment in the ministry procedures under the Housing Act of 2003 or under the national housing program, uh, we, uh, we are, uh, although we are the main factor. Uh, here you can see our national housing policy uh, and active land policy is just one stone in the last pillar. And um, uh, are we, let's say, uh, are we uh, in line with that? Do, do we has, have a, uh, that sp special, let's, a special priority under that? We, no, we don't have it. For example, we don't have active development agency like you, uh, you said uh, or found uh, that would actively um, develop land in Slovenia, so we have to do it ourselves. Um, so um, to go further on, uh, in Slovenia, there are established measures uh, to, uh, to have active land policy, but to be to be very exact, we have to do everything ourselves. Administrative and legislative major measures are not, uh, let's say, <coughs> sorry, updated. Financial measures uh, are not in place to serve uh, us as a main housing provider uh, in the state. Spatial planning measures are equal for all the uh, for all uh, that are entering the the market. And f uh, to go even further. <coughs> the development stages and communal and other equipment of land, uh, we are faced all the private investment investors and uh, a public investor with the same problems and we don't have uh, 
we don't dif the dif differentiate uh, between us. So when we are doing the consolidation of lands, um, we, have, we face the problem that local community, they don't have enough funds. Um, so um, how do we do it? Let's say, uh, if I skip some, uh, some uh, uh, slides. Um, we, have, we, we invest in our own product. Uh, we have the uh, building products for nonprofit and um, affordable rental. We also co-finance and co-invest in cooperation with municipalities and other uh, applicants or providers. That it means with uh, local funds, with nonprofit organizations. And uh, we also buy the housing units and accommodations on the basic of our call, uh, and that's the, our interaction with the public sector. So, uh, because in Slovenia we don't have that 12 or 20 or 30 or 40, even 45 percent uh, uh, in, uh, pro in projects for uh, non profit or affordable housing, but uh, our fund uh, really supports if. Uh, Private investors uh, dedicate those 12 uh, to 20, 30, or 45 percent, and the, that's why we strive to build, uh, to buy uh, apartments in those projects. <coughs> we are also buying uh, land for construction on our own, and um, that's kind of a, a, a prioritizing. Uh, this is kind of a axis in which Slovenia needs for housing are going. And you can see uh, we strive to, um, to buy land in, uh, in those directions. And um, uh, we always we have a saying that we go where the local community and people want us. OK, uh, so while we're finished, uh, here you can see uh, our, or some of our projects. Uh, these are the projects that are, let's say, mixed. We have uh, uh, apartments that is sold to the private persons. We uh, have apartments that are for elderly, apartments for uh, non-profit, and apartments for, uh, for uh, uh, other types of housing. And this is uh, what we are doing now. Um, maybe just to say, uh, that we always build uh, on our land, and that's uh, some, let's say, uh, exception for Slovenia, because we are the only um, actor that, uh, is from Slovenian national point of view, that also uh, owns this land. Others just have the use of the public-owned land. Um, maybe just this is for the start. Uh, sorry for being a bit longer. Um, Okay, we run a little bit over time, but I think we have maybe 10 minutes. I see you have submitted your questions. So I'm gonna to try to get through this very quickly, if I can. The slides disappeared. I don't know if the person who can bring them back, because we do have the link again. But anyway, I invite the speakers just to quickly join me on stage. Ah, oh, yes, perfect, okay. I'm gonna sit in the middle here. <coughs> so the first question I have here is for Dervla. So you mentioned that uh, in Ireland at the moment, due to higher interest rates and other cost factors, um, that some construction products have become unviable or they're on the limit of viability. So the question is, how do you work with the owners of private land to try to, uh, in these situations, to try and incorporate affordability into the housing stock? It's a, it's a good question indeed. And, and look, we, we appreciate the, the challenges there in terms of finance. Um, the costs of finance going up. So I think in terms of the land development agency, what we're what we're trying to do is look at where there's particularly housing need and demand. So there's got to be linked to that. It's got to be linked to locations that are that are well serviced and um, and that and that fit with our remit about low carbon development. So so what we did was was go out to the market and invite expressions of interest. So we have this um, project Tossi is what it's called. So we we forward purchase um, developments in that sense, or parts of developments um, for cost rental and affordable purchase housing. So it is a negotiated um, uh, you know, uh, uh, agreement, essentially, with developers. We do have to you know, make sure that we're delivering in the public interest, but also in terms of you know, the, the economics um, all, all makes sense as well. So yes, it's, it's through procurement, 
that we invite that. We'll certainly be looking at forward funding as well, potentially into the future as well, but there are risks. And I think that, you know, it's, it's really interesting hearing about Austria and we're, we're envious about how that, that works there, you know, because actually that's the way you want it to go. Because, you know, when you're seeing that slow, low return over time, um, it does make a difference. We need to get that mindset right, that this is about the future and outcomes and choice for people. So, yes, in senses, we, we do have to use some of that upfront subsidy and government are looking at that um, at the moment through their Housing for All strategy. So that is helpful. But particularly, you know, we're seeing in certain locations where you know, the apartment typology is, is a big issue. You know, if you're looking at higher rise, that is a problem. So if there is a market failure or an area where we're seeing a problem, we have the opportunity to, to look at that, but, but, it's, but, it's, but, but it's specific and, and driven by that. So what we're trying to do is bring in the choice and deliver low carbon affordable housing um, for all. Perfect, thank you very much. Uh, next question, I'm going to try and give at least one question for all the speakers. I think we do have one. Next question, very quickly for Ivan, is in the situation where the rent of the, in the private market is controlled, um, how do you therefore incentivize private uh, landlords, for example, to renovate a property? Because if they renovate, does this really make sense for them from a business model point of view? Oh, okay. Well, the, the market in Barcelona, uh, rental market, it's quite... Uh, um, uh, there's a lot of owners, like, like there's no big owner, so it's quite uh, different to, to, uh, to what we, I think uh, you have in the rest of Europe, I think. Uh, what we have here is subsidies, uh, and these are uh, public ones. We, we, do, we do these subsidies for the, the uh, owners. Uh, what, uh, what we have done in the last uh, years is um, to focus these subsidies into uh, the mm, the proper the owners that uh, have until now they didn't uh, have access to them because they they had uh, property property problems like maybe they didn't have a, a community of properties of, of owners so this is the change we have made in the last years uh, but it is still going on and we 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 are um, very confident that the next generation funds will will help us with that. Okay, That's perfect. It. The next question uh, goes to Bernd, and I think maybe it could even be a one-word answer, let's see. Uh, the question is, is federally owned land included in Vienna's new social housing zoning regulation? Yes. <laughs> Perfect, yes. <laughs> uh, question for Julie, I believe, sorry, if I go back. And thank you again to everyone who did ask a question. It's very useful. Usually I have to make them up. Uh, so the question for Judy is, so um, in Finland, planning agreements or zoning are used to promote social housing in areas owned by private landowners. Do you think this is, could be a model that could be used in other countries too? So where private, <laughs> private land is actually then brought on board to, to develop social and affordable housing. Yes, uh, and it clearly is. <laughs> <laughs> um, you see it also in Vienna. So it's, it's uh, quite common and it's all over America. It's a uh, it's standard form actually, in, in some systems, yeah. Uh, there, there is one question <laughs> about if it's, uh, uh, how long does it last? I, in general, it's on contract basis, and just in Germany, you have now uh, the situation that uh, uh, quite a lot of contracts are go uh, running out, and they lose more affordable housing than they gain by this concept. So you have the... You have to look at the long-term project, and so uh, this is in, in Austria it's solved if um, that you have a private sector, a private limited profit sector, and in the the rest of the private sector it's only 40 years. Uh, so, and after these 40 years you come you come into a problem. Perfect. Okay. So we have one final question, then we can wrap up. Yes. So for in Slovenian case. I was actually in Ljubljana about two weeks ago, a very beautiful city, but it's a relatively low density city maybe. Yeah. I know that traffic is a huge problem. I saw leaving Ljubljana in the morning, three hour tailbacks trying to get into the city. So the, the question is how do you develop more housing in Ljubljana while still keeping the, the essence of the city and the, and the charm of the city, for example? How, how, does, how do you square that circle? 
Yeah, that's uh, that's one of the biggest problems. Uh, me, I'm coming from the coastal area of Slovenia, and each da each uh, day I uh, need one hour and a half to work, and at least two hours from work, and uh, that's a huge problem. And um, let's let's me say it that way. Uh, we we want to get out of Ljubljana to be uh, near Ljubljana. Um, we uh, let's say the local communities that are around Ljubljana are very very. Uh, ta uh, very connected with Ljubljana. So we try to build that uh, uh, that connections with local communities and to have projects uh, just outside Ljubljana, maybe five to 10 kilometers and to have different routes, not just those main routes uh, to Ljubljana. But this is a problem because a lot of people commute and the public service is not so good. V very quick, yes. Uh, <coughs> that unaffordable housing and traffic congestion are actually both yeah. products of bad planning, yeah. bad land policy. So keep those in mind. Uh, they are two sides of that coin. Yes. As someone who comes from a very, very low density city in Dublin, I can tell you that that's <laughs> definitely the issue. Okay, look, thank you very, very much for your questions, for your attendance. Um, there was supposed to be a slide here, but I, I don't see it. Basically, to tell you that um, today's event was recorded, you will be able to watch that recording on the housing agency's website. Also, the slides were made available also to the Housing Agency's website, and I think potentially even through the Housing Europe website in the coming days. So if you do want to get access to this information, please, you can find it there. But a uh, big round of applause, I think, for our speakers and for everyone else. Thank you very much.